But you know, the Bible makes it quite clear that our God is a God of mercy and compassion. But the scripture also declares in the New Testament that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We're going to be talking about the tension between God's judgment and His mercy in this broadcast. You're not going to want to miss a single moment of it. During my this personal study this week, I uh, was looking at where figs and fig trees are mentioned everywhere in the Bible, from Genesis all the way through the end of the book, and led me to two narratives that I want to share with you today. And, you know, they are connected in, in some ways via principle but the, the honest, the connection that came just because there was fig trees mentioned in both of them. So that's, that's how I am tying these two things together. One of them deals with God's mercy. The other one deals with God's judgment. And we want to look at these two things. The first one being in Genesis chapter 3. Turn there with me if you would. Genesis 3. We want to read verses 1 through 10. Genesis 3, verses 1 through 10. Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit, and she ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. It's quite a story, isn't it? Did you know... In this story, we see that Adam and Eve disbelieved God's word and yet believed the word of the devil, of the serpent. They believed what the serpent said above what God had said. And I, I, I think that God perhaps has no greater pleasure than when we believe him, than when we just believe his word. And it said that Eve saw that the tree was pleasant, that it was good for food. Look back with me, if you would, in chapter 2 and verse 9. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So there wasn't anything different as far as appearance went about this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The description we have of it is identical to the other trees in the garden. There was nothing about the color of its fruit or its shape or the broadness of its leaf that would have led Adam or Eve to believe that there, that there would be some kind of dire consequence if they partook of it. All they had was God's word. And Eve would have thought, I see nothing that confirms what God has said. I don't believe it. The devil said, you won't die. God said, it will die. Well, the tree, it's, it's pleasant to look at. It's good for food, just like all the other trees. There's nothing alarming about it. That There is nothing that registers with my senses that would confirm what God has said about this tree. And because of that, she didn't believe what God had said, and she ate she gave to her husband with her. Adam stood and watched the whole thing go down. He had no corrupt nature. 
in his flesh or in his spirit to betray him. It was willful rebellion. And they did die. Now, in our English Bible, it says, you'll surely die. But, but in the original Hebrew, God said to them, you will die, die. The word dies there twice. You'll die a double death. And they did die that day. They died a spiritual death. It means to be cut off from God, to be separated from God. So Adam and Eve were cut off from the life of God. And we see that fear and shame entered the world along with their sin. And to this day, fear and shame still attend sin. You know, in between service, I was sitting in a room getting something to eat, door open, and came our daughter-in-law, Bethany, with Asher and Sawyer. And Asher, as he always does, ran across the room, jumped into my lap, Papa! And he squeezes me like he's going to take all the, the oxygen out of my lungs. He puts his head on my chest, and he does that, I mean, in our house. He runs across the room, Papa! When he gets there, jumps up in my arms. Last night, he was here with Harrison. I happened to arrive the same time they did. He's at the end of a hallway. Papa! He runs as fast as he can. And I got on one knee and he jumps and he just clings to me. It's one of the joys of, of being a grandparent. And I think it must have been that way in the garden. When the Lord shot up, Adam just ran, Lord! Embraced him and held him. I missed you. I'm so glad that you're here. The Lord said, I miss you too, Adam. What do you want to do today? Well, Lord, there's these amazing fish. I found them at the other side of the garden. I haven't named them yet. Would you like to come see them? That'd be great, Adam. Well, it's, it's a long hike. You don't mind, do you? No, let's go. <laughs> so they walk, and they're laughing, and they're fellowshipping, and they're talking. But now when Adam sins, he doesn't run to God. He runs from God. And he's ashamed, and he tries to cover up his shame and cover his sin with the fig leaves. Job said this in Job 31, verse 33, if I have covered my transgressions as Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom. And that's what Adam tried to do. He tried to cover his transgression symbolized by the fig leaves. And Adam and Eve's eyes were opened, but not the way the devil had promised. The eyes of their conscience were suddenly opened, and they could see, they, they, they could see the happiness they'd fallen from and the misery they'd fallen into. Their eyes were open, and they saw they were naked. Literally, they saw that they were stripped. They saw that they'd been stripped of the innocent beauty that they had possessed a few moments before. They saw they were stripped of their intimacy with God, stripped of their pure and sinless nature, stripped of the dominion God had given them, stripped of the honor and joy of their home in paradise. They saw that they were stripped of their peace, stripped of their happiness, stripped of all of the privileges and bounties that God had given them. The devil said, your eyes will be open and you'll see. But he didn't tell them that they'd be seeing angels in a flaming sword guarding the entrance to the garden, keeping them out. But that's what they saw. And I think about God in this story. When Adam transgresses, does God suddenly appear in fire and earthquake and boom out, Adam, you fool! You've damned yourself. You've damned your offspring. There was no law of sin working in your flesh to draw you into temptation. How dare you believe the serpent over me? You rebel, you traitor. I disown you. No, God doesn't suddenly appear thundering out judgment. In fact, he doesn't appear at all. At least not for a while. The indication we're given is that God comes sometime later. And when he does come in the cool of the day, he comes walking. How odd is that? He must have been in human form if he was walking. Perhaps in the person of the second part of the Trinity. And I, I think that may be how God walked and talked with Adam and Eve in the garden. It was Jesus Christ. And he comes walking almost to display the fact that he's slow to anger. 
and that he's great in mercy. I mean, the most horrific sin in human history opened the door to hell, threw the whole earth into chaos. And God walks in to that scene, displaying his restraint. And we read in verse 8 that they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden and they went and hid. And the word sound literally means voice. Most translations will have it that way. It's the same word translated voice throughout the Old Testament. It wasn't that God, you know, was breaking twigs as he's walking through the garden. They heard the voice of the Lord God. And then later on in the next verse it says, and then the Lord called out to Adam, where are you? But up, up to this point, God, he's just talking to himself come sometime later, and they can hear his voice. He's talking. And they run and hide. What was he saying? Well, I think I have an idea. You know, God does talk to himself a number of times in the Bible. One of the times is, and we won't turn there now, I'd encourage you to read it later, is in Hosea chapter 11. God's people Israel have disobeyed him once again, and God is having a monologue. He's talking to himself. And he says, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and I held him close, and I taught him to walk. But when I called to them, they ran to their idols. I drew them with cords of love. I delivered them, and I cared from them. But their hearts are set on backsliding against me. But how can I give them up or how can I hand them over as these cities that have been destroyed? And then God says, my heart is churning within me. My heart is torn. I will not execute the fierceness of my anger for I am God and not man. I will not come in wrath. And I think it had to be something similar there in the garden as God is walking. I was thinking, he's my son. I created him in my image and in my likeness. We, 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 we've talked and we, we've, we've loved and we've laughed. I've given him dominion over all of my creation. But I can't respond in my anger. I won't respond in my anger. I'm going to show mercy. And then God calls out, Adam, where are you? And God knew where he was. It's a question of spiritual nature. Where are you spiritually, Adam? And then he tells them that there will be consequences to their actions, but he immediately speaks of redemption. He immediately begins to sow hope into their future, prophesying about the seed of Eve, Jesus Christ, crushing the serpent's head and bringing a redemption that cleanses and restores and brings back fellowship and glory and peace and dominion and everything that has been lost. And I have a word for you today. If you've sinned, don't run from God. Don't get your fig leaves out and try and cover your transgressions. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Psalm 145, verses 8 and 9 says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, great in mercy. The Lord is good to all, and His tender mercies are over all His works. As the old hymn said, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Ever since by faith I saw that stream, thy flowing wounds supply. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. Friend, we serve a God of mercy. Amen. Should you look with me at Luke chapter 13, if you would? Another narrative here, and, and once again, the thing that tied it together, at least in my study, was the fig tree. 
We want to read verses 1 through 9 of Luke 13. There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found it none. Then he said to the keeper of the vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that, you can cut it down. Now, Jesus' parable and the narrative are connected. And I want to share with you just four simple lessons from these verses in Luke chapter 13. Lesson number one is this. Don't attribute bad things to God's judgment. Don't point at great sufferers and say they must be great sinners experiencing God's wrath. Friends, sometimes bad things happen to good people. And you don't need to have your blood shed by an occupying army or have a tower fall upon you. You can die in your old age, in your bed, surrounded by friends with beautiful music playing, and you will be damned if you don't repent. Jesus made that clear. You're going to perish like him if you don't repent. It's an inward change of heart resulting in an outward change of direction. Turn to God and receive and accept his mercy. Look with me, if you would again, at this story. There's a second lesson I want to share with you. Because the parable that Jesus told about the fig tree in the vineyard directly ties into the preceding narrative. Second lesson is this. Bad things can happen when there is no intercessor. You see, Jesus' parable in part was an explanation for the men that had been butchered by Pilate soldiers and for those that fell or that died as the tower fell upon them. He tells this story of the fig tree that obviously represents a person and judgment, destruction, is heading towards that person. Destruction is on its way until someone stands in between and gains more time for the tree. That person, my friend, is called an intercessor. And they found mercy. And they found another chance for that tree to produce fruit. Did you know the Bible says God searches for an intercessor? Don't underestimate the power your prayers can have. Your prayers will keep some people alive long enough to get saved. But sometimes bad things happen because God can't find an intercessor. And then, as always, Jesus' parables are, are layered, and you can look at them from different vantage points. The third lesson is this, that when God does judge, it is righteous judgment. This fig tree that represents a person was given every possible opportunity to bear fruit. It wasn't grown by the wayside like that fig tree that Jesus cursed. This man, it says he planted it in his vineyard. Well, a vineyard is for vines, but he's given it special care. And according to Isaiah 5, God said, I planted a vineyard, and I cleared it out, and I pl planted my choicest vines, and he went into his vineyard expecting to find fruit. He has proprietary right of ownership of this tree. He has a right to expect fruit. And then you know it says that he didn't send someone. He came to it personally himself. Not once, not twice, but numerous times. Over a period of many years, this person has had 
encounter with God. He's come to them personally. And then even after that, he gives more time and gives more chances. It's had the best soil, the best attention, more than ample time. And finally, all available means are exhausted and judgment comes. No one will be able to say on judgment day, God, you're unfair. You never gave me a chance. No one. God is infinite in his patience and his kindness. And he comes to people through one way or another over and over and over. And I don't know how that plays out in every person's life, in every culture, anywhere in the world, but I am satisfied that God is just. He is fair. And no one will be able to point a finger at him on judgment day say, you are unfair. You were unfair with me. You didn't give me a chance. No, every mouth will be stopped. When God's judgment does come, no excuses. People have every opportunity. Now, again, I don't know how God sees through that in every person's life, but you can rest assured that our God is just. Fourth lesson, an intercessor has come. Jesus is the great intercessor who bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Wrath and punishment was due us, but the stroke of divine judgment fell upon him, and he took our place. And you know, if I can just be so bold to just suggest that through this message and by the Holy Spirit, God, the owner of the vineyard, is coming to you. And I would venture to say, probably not for the first time. I think you can look on the history of your life and see God's fingerprints at numerous times through numerous different channels. And he's coming to you yet once again. You're being nourished with the water of the word. Through his Holy Spirit, he's endeavoring to break up the fallow ground of your heart. But in the end, only you can choose to repent. Only you can turn to him and bring forth the fruit of a life that has been given to God. And you start by saying yes to Jesus. And I realize that people say, well, you know, I'm just, I'm not ready yet. I know it's true, but man, I got a few more wild oats I want to sow and I'm kind of having fun right now being the boss of my own life. I'm not saying God won't be there for you tomorrow. He will be. And the next day, and the next, and the next, and the next after that. But you need to consider this. When you know the truth and you push it away from you, something happens in your heart. It becomes hard. And the more you put it off and the more you push it away, the harder your heart becomes. And the more difficult it becomes to respond. The Apostle Paul talked about it, the people that, that pushed the truth and suppressed the truth to the point that they were finally completely reprobate. Jesus talked about that hardening process. And I like the old King James Version. Talked about people's hearts waxing gross. Or dull or hard. Just like you'd say that a moon is waxed full. It happened by degrees, little by little, and suddenly you have a full moon. That's why the Bible says today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. When you know he's knocking, when you have a sense that God's dealing with you, even if it's, it's that little still small voice, respond. You don't want to push him off for another day. I'd like you to just bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment if you would. We're just going to pray together. If you just say the words and you don't put a heart behind them, they, they're empty. They don't mean anything. They won't do anything. But if you'll put a sincere heart behind them, God will change you inside by his spirit. Something amazing will happen in your life. But you pray after me. You say, oh God, I humble my heart before you. And I want to thank you for loving me so much and for loving the whole world so much that you would send your son to die in our place. 
Jesus, thank you for taking the penalty for our sins, for my sins. I believe you died and were raised from the dead. And I ask you now to be my Lord. I come to you by faith. I put my trust in you to change me, to guide me, to walk with me and talk with me. From this moment forward, my life is not my own. Putting everything in your hands, Jesus. I'm giving you access to every area of my life. There's nothing off limits to you. I'm yours, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. Awesome. Awesome. I hope that you were encouraged by that broadcast. And you need to know that there is a God in heaven that knows your name. You're not some faceless person in a crowd to him. In fact, he sees you right there listening to me right now. Open your heart to him. He can solve the challenges and problems of your life. You are loved by God.